Hello everyone, Tim again here and today I have the pleasure of bringing you another one of my real life football videos. But before I get into the commentary, there's just one thing I wanted to quickly talk about and that's the game in the background. Now, this is a online friendlies game with my mate John, you've seen him plenty of times before, don't need to explain who it is. And it is a game between Colombia, who I'm playing, and AS Monaco. And we decided to have a Falcao off, because obviously Falcao plays for both of these teams. So we decided to see which Falcao was better. And it's a really interesting game pretty exciting to watch in the background so I hope you enjoy that but today's commentary is going to be about England at the World Cup again and you know obviously this week England qualified for the Brazil 2014 World Cup so what I decided to do was if the squad was announced tomorrow which 23 players would I pick so I've gone through I've had a, had a little bit of a think and these are the 23 players I would pick for the World Cup so starting in goal let's have a look at the three goalkeepers number one Joe Hart pretty self-explanatory that one you know he's been in for a lot of criticism over the last year or so and I personally think he's massively underperformed he's a much better keeper than he's shown at the moment he needs to step it up and improve but there's there's no question on his day he is the best goalkeeper in England on his day he's one of the best goalkeepers in the world I mean look back to the Champions League game last season Manchester City versus Dortmund Dortmund could have scored 17 goals that night. Joe Hart had an unbelievable game, managed to salvage a point for his team. Yeah, and that's the sort of thing he can do. A penalty shootout versus Italy as well in the Euros. You know, he saved a penalty, he just looked like a, a proper keep. You know, he was smiling, he's trying to put players off, you know, going all over the place. And if it wasn't for the quality of Andrea Perlo and the absolute ham fistedness of players like Ashley Young, we would have probably won a penalty shootout for the first time in our incredibly checkered penalty shootout history. So. Joe Hart absolutely nailed on to the, the World Cup. Second goalkeeper I'd pick is Fraser Forster. I mean, Fraser Forster, again, very, very talented goalkeeper. He's, he's done brilliantly at Celtic in the Champions League last couple of seasons. You know, both performances against Barcelona were top class, both uh, last year and this season. He's incredibly tall and powerful. He's great under the high ball. And he's a very, very good shot stopper. He's just a great keeper. I don't know why Newcastle let him go, to be quite honest with you, because he's just been absolutely tremendous for Celtic, and he would be on the plane. I'd love to see him play in a couple of the, the warm-up friendlies, you know. The last thing we want to happen is if Joe Hart gets an injury, you know, Fraser Forster's thrown in at the deep end in the quarterfinals of the World Cup for his first England appearance. That would be an absolute nightmare. So for me, he's got to go on the plane. He's got to play a, at least one game before the World Cup just so he can, you know, get a feel of what it's like to play for England, so, you know, learn a, a few matchups with some of the defenders because, you know, he's never played with the defenders who play for England before. So just a, a, even 45 minutes behind Jagiel Kake, Hill, Ashley Cole, all those sorts of players would do him a, a world of good. So that's the second goalkeeper. Third goalkeeper is John Ruddy. And John Ruddy, another very, very solid choice. And the, the third choice goalkeeper at a World Cup is almost guaranteed not to have a sniff at all. But John Ruddy, if he was called on, I'm sure he'd do a very, very decent job. You know, I've only seen him made one mistake pretty much since he's been in the Premier League, and that was um, the game against Manchester City, I think, when he just made a, a really poor save and Manchester City capitalised on it. But apart from that, he's very, very composed, good shot stopper. He's just a more traditional keep, you know. He isn't flamboyant by any stretch of the imagination. You know, he, he doesn't make flying fingertip saves that look great for the cameras, but he's just nice and tidy, just does most of the things very, very well. So he'd be the third choice goalkeeper. And I think those three goalkeepers are pretty much the best three available. Obviously, people would mention players like Ben Foster, but he's retired from international football. Unless he changes that, those are the three keepers I'd go for. So let's move into defence now. Starting with the left-backs, I'd go for Ashley Cole, first choice left-back. Well, first pick I'm going to mention, whether it be first choice, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But Ashley Cole, you know, probably the best left back this country's ever produced. He's absolutely, he's a great player. He's fantastic. He's been a stalwart of the England team for many, many years. And he's a very, very experienced player. You know, many, many caps now. He's got to go. He's, he's really got to go. Fantastic player. You know, pretty self-explanatory there. And the second left back I'd pick is Leighton Baines again. You know, at the moment, I think he's the best left back in the country. For me, if I was picking the England team tomorrow, he would start ahead of Ashley Cole if both of them were fit. I mean, we saw in these two games here just what an incredible attacking threat he poses. I mean, set up Wayne Rooney's goal against Poland with an unbelievable cross. He's just got so much energy, gets up and down the touchline, and his technical ability is absolutely tremendous. You know, he's not just a guy who runs around. He has brilliant delivery. He takes 
incredible free kicks and set pieces. He's just uh, he's a modern left back, you know, in every single way. He's a tremendous player. Definitely take him on the plane. And the third left back I'm going to take, a little bit unusual, perhaps is Luke Shaw. Now, Luke Shaw is a bit of a debatable pick, but I wanted to take him because there's no doubt in my mind that he is the future of England at that position. He has been tremendous for Southampton this season and the season before when he played. Again, he's that modern fullback. He's not just a solid player defensively, he's tremendous going forward. He's created so many chances. He's won penalties for Southampton this season. You know, he's a great young player. And again, third choice left back. Is he really going to play? Probably not. But I think it would be brilliant experience for him just to get on the plane, get to a World Cup, World Cup in Brazil as well. Great experience for him because in five, ten years' time, when he's you know our number one left back, that little bit of experience would be absolutely tremendous for him. So those are the three left backs. Let's move into the central defensive position. The players I'm going to pick in defence are Gary Cahill, Phil Jagielka, and Phil Jones. Now I've only decided to pick three central defenders because I wanted to fit Luke Shaw in the squad. So that meant I had to pinch a player from somewhere. So I have gone from the centre-backs. Now what I would do is I'd have Chris Smalling on injury reserve. So if the worst came to the worst and a centre-back was injured, I'd bring Chris Smalling into the squad. So that's what I would do. But I think Cahill and Jagielka are beginning to show that they are good players. You know, they had a bit of a rocky start for England. But what are we expecting? You know, we've had John Terry and Rio Ferdinand for the past 10 years. You know, arguably our best central defensive partnership of all time. Anyone else apart from those two was always going to be a slightly underwhelming start. But for me, they've got more solid. They, they look more of a partnership now. Gary Cahill's good on the ball as well. He's composed. You saw him a couple of times against Poland. You know, under pressure, he just a little bit of a shimmy. He'd move the ball into midfield. He'd run it out. Nice little pass. You know, took the pressure away. Jagielka is a little bit more of a an old-fashioned centre half. You know, just a big guy. He'll you know put himself about, put tackles in blocks, win headers. He's not as good on the ball as a Cahill, I think. But again, two very very solid defenders. I I'm pretty pleased with how they they're playing at the moment. So those would be my first choice defenders. And then Phil Jones. You know, Phil Jones is in my opinion a much better centre back than he is any other position I mean, we've seen him play right back we've seen him play in central defensive midfield or we've seen him play in just normal central midfield and for me he's not as good in those positions as he is just as a normal centre back he's good on the ball you know the only reason he can play in midfield is because he's versatile and he's composed on the ball and he can pass. So he's got all of those attributes, but he's also a very, very solid central, central defender. So he's a, a very, very able deputy. And like I mentioned, on injury reserve, I'd put Chris Smalling in. Another young defender. You know, he's tall. We saw him play at the Tuesday night, sorry, not the weekend. They said at the weekend then. But we saw him play at right back. And for me... No, he's, he's definitely not a right-back. He's much better at centre-back. He, he's OK on the ball. But when you compare him to a Leighton Baines, you know, Leighton Baines is a, a full-back because he's fantastic on the ball. Smalling, he just looked out of position. He's not an international right-back, but he is a, a capable centre-back. So if the worst happened and one of the centre-backs got injured, that's who I'd bring in. So those are the centre-backs out of the way. Let's talk about the right-backs. Now, I've only gone for two right-backs because Phil Jones can deputise at right-back if we need him to. He would be my third choice if there were injuries, but I've gone for Glenn Johnson and Kyle Walker. And I think these two players are very, very evenly matched. I would just give it to Kyle Walker at the moment, and that's because, for me, I don't really trust Glenn Johnson defensively. Just looking back to the last year, as I can remember the game against Ukraine when we won 3-2 in the group, and Glenn Johnson was at fault for both goals. You know, he just poor marking for the free kick, just defensive errors. He just doesn't seem to be able to defend as well as he can, he can attack. And don't get me wrong, he's absolutely fantastic going forward. He really is a great attacking fullback. But for me, he needs to solidify his defensive attributes a little bit. And it, the same does go for Kyle Walker. But I think Kyle Walker gets away with it a little bit more because he's just searingly quick. He's literally, he's one of the fastest players in the Premier League. He's just rapid. And so, you know, everyone always says the first yard's in the head, but the next nine yards are on the floor. So when you're as quick as Kyle Walker, you can get away with being a little bit out of position or whatever because you're just that fast. You know, I would just shade Kyle Walker. A little bit of a tight decision, I know, but both are good fullbacks depending on how they play for the rest of the year which one of them gets the nod that's that's how i decide it but at the moment 
I go for Kyle Walker. So that's the, the all of the defenders listed. Let's go into midfield. First choice, captain Steven Gerrard. No reason for me to explain why Steven Gerrard's in the England squad. One of the best players I've ever seen. One of the best players England have ever had, I think. Just, you know, fantastic player. Can take set pieces. He just so good on the ball he's just an, an inspiring presence for everyone in the team you know when you when you look and you see you've got Steven Gerrard in the side you always think yeah yeah we, we've got a chance you know Gerrard can do something fantastic scores plenty of goals as well scored a lot of goals scored a very very important goal again in on Tuesday night you know 1-0 going into the last five minutes you know nail biting times who's there making a dart and run forward shouldering off a defender and then towing it into the net Steven Gerrard and you know Gerrard has done that for years probably going to be his last World Cup definitely on the team you know I'd start him every game nailed uncertainty the second midfielder I'd bring along Michael Carrick you know Michael Carrick I think has always been an underrated player he's very very good on the ball he just does a lot of things which people don't normally notice he's not flashy at all but he's just composed he can pass and he sits a little bit deeper because you know, now we've got Gerard. Gerard's not as young as he once was. Obviously, everyone's always getting older. He's you know not as mobile as he once was. So just having someone who naturally sits a little bit deeper and just controls the play and all that good stuff, I think that's definitely required. And he's very very good on the ball. And I think he plays a lot better when he has someone solid alongside him. So if he played alongside a Gerard, that'd be great. Because we saw in the Manchester derby. You know, he, he struggled in midfield because Marwan Fellaini had a bad game that night. And I don't think Carrick's a player who can really take a game and dominate it by himself. But if you've got a midfield that you can rely on around you, Carrick's a great player to have because he'll just make sure that nothing bad happens. He'll just control it. He'll knock the ball around nicely. He'll start moves off for you with good passes. And he'll always be there to help out defensively. I can remember him... Tuesday night, absolutely fantastic defensive header from a corner, marking Robert Lewandowski. You know, the corner dropped on the six yard line, and everyone thought, oh dear, what's he doing? And he, he shouldered his way past, he headed the ball onto Lewandowski's head, and he, he, he made a great play, and he won a, a goal kick. You know, very, very solid player, does a lot of unspectacular things very well, so I get him in the team definitely. Third midfielder I've gone for, Frank Lampard. Frank Lampard again. Probably going to be his last World Cup. He's been a very, very good player for England. You know, everyone gives Fat Frank a lot of stick. You know, whether him and Gerard could play well together, but he he's definitely one of the best eight midfielders in the country. I don't think you could say he isn't. You know, he he takes a good penalty. He's missed a couple, but he's normally a good penalty taker. He hits a good free kick. He's decent on the ball, and he'll always be a goal threat. You know, even now. He's you know getting a bit older and he doesn't make those darting runs forward anymore. He always finds space in the pen penalty area. He can always score goals. You know, Lampard for me is a, another guaranteed to be on the plane. Whether I'd start him ahead of Michael Carrick, I'm not sure. But having someone like that in the team, very very worthwhile. You know, we've got a couple of young players coming through, a couple of players who have got no real experience at tournaments. So having someone like Lampard there is definitely worth it. You know, had a lot of caps for his country. Very, very solid player. Good player to have in the team. So, that's three central midfielders so far. The next guy I put on the list is a winger. And this is Theo Walcott. You know, for me, I always think Theo Walcott gets a lot of unfair criticism. And a stat that I like to, to reel out a lot of the times is... Over the last two years, Theo Walcott has created more goals and scored more goals than Gareth Bale has. And Gareth Bale is now the most valuable player of all time and everyone's singing from the rafters how good he is. And Theo Walcott, everyone says how useless he is and how he doesn't do anything with the ball and how overrated he is. And you know, It's just a little bit of a paradox that the stats show that Theo Walcott is a very, very effective player. You know, he's quick. I think he plays better as a striker, personally. I, I think he's better when he runs through because he's just searingly fast. He, he always keeps defenders on their toes. He always makes them drop deeper as well, and that gives your players like Rooney, etc., who will come on to later, more space. So having someone like Walcott in the team, definitely worthwhile. I really do like Theo Walcott. One of my one of my favourite players, a player I've always you know appreciated and always liked. And like I said, for me, he always gets a lot of unfair criticism, but he's always a threat. He's always useful. He could do nothing all game, but that one great through ball through, and he's buff, he's off, no one's catching him. You know, he's a very, very useful player to have in your team. And then on the other wing, a player who's just burst on into the England scene with absolutely fantastic ability, Andros Townsend. Yeah, Andros Townsend tore 
Montenegro and Poland apart. He was absolutely fantastic. You know, he's so direct. Whenever he picks the ball up, he's only got one thing on his mind, and that is run forward. Now, there are questions about him that he perhaps shoots too often. That's one of the things that uh, a lot of Spurs fans and Spurs management were saying about him, that he's just a little bit too trigger happy. And occasionally it works out, as he did um, on his international debut when he hit that absolute screamer with his right foot into the uh, into the side of the net. Great goal, that. But for me, he's just such a threat. He, he's someone that we really we didn't have too many people of because when you compare him to like a, a James Milner you know Milner is very very solid and dependable but he's not an Andrus Townsend he's not someone who's going to terrify fullbacks and Townsend's certainly someone who can do that I mean we saw on Poland against Poland on Tuesday you know Townsend was getting so much of the ball and was such a threat that they began to double up on him you know they began to bring players over to try and put extra pressure on him and that created so much more space for Leighton Baines on the other side of the pitch and then Baines was in acres of space and if you went back to Baines you'd leave Townsend free and you know, it just improves the balance of our side to have players like that on both flanks and for me I'm, I was really really impressed with how uh, Andros Townsend played and he'd definitely be on the flight Next player I'm going to go for, another central midfielder, is Jack Wilshire. Jack Wilshire, one of our great young prospects, fantastic player. You know, the I was always a little bit sceptical about Jack Wilshire because in this country we always big up young players to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I was like, yeah, he's a great player, but is he really going to be that next level of player? And then saw him, I think it was against Germany, playing at Wembley. He was just fantastic. He was fantastic that night. He's put in fantastic performances for the, in the Champions League for Arsenal. He has really begun to show what a talented player he is. And if he stops smoking and if he gets himself focused on the pitch, he can be a, a, a great player, definitely. So, Wilshire's very, very good as well because he adds a little bit of extra youth into our midfield. When you look at our midfield three of Gerard, Carrick and Lampard. You know, the youngest is Carrick at 32 there. They're not exactly the most sprightly midfielders. So having someone like a Wilshire who's prepared to run around in midfield and put tackles in, definitely worth having. He's good on the ball as well. Just a, a really good player. I, I do like Jack Wilshire. And for me, he'd be on the plane. Again, it's a tough decision who whether he'd play ahead of Carrick because for me Gerard is a guaranteed start and then depending on the situation you'd, you'd play either three in midfield and you'd have Carrick and Wilshire or perhaps you'd play Wilshire if you wanted to play Lampard because you know you can't for me I, I don't like playing Carrick Gerard and Lampard in the, in the same midfield for the reason I mentioned you know they're not the most sprightly and Carrick does sit deep but you know, we saw against Poland on Tuesday we were vulnerable on the counter-attack and we don't have you know as youthful a midfield as we once did so Jack Wilshire definitely helped balance that out. And another young player I'd pick in midfield is Ross Barkley. Now, Ross Barkley's been touted for a number of years to be a very, very talented young player. And he hasn't really done anything, you know. He hasn't had a lot of opportunities. He sort of went under the radar for a little bit of time after that massive hype train started early. But this season for Everton, he's been very, very good. And for me, this is sort of like a Luke Shaw pick again. Whether he'll play much of a role in the World Cup, I don't know. He, he could definitely get an appearance or two, but you're not going to base your World Cup campaign around Ross Barkley, are you? But again, he's the future of our national team. Taking him to the World Cup in Brazil, perhaps giving him 45 minutes here and there, perhaps in the third group game, because you know, we're, we're seeded in the second pot. So we might be drawn against the Brazil. So you, you definitely want your best team up against Brazil. But then we might have a, a, you know, a lower ranked team in the group and you want to rest players for that big Brazil game. So you'd start Ross Barkley or you'd bring Ross Barkley on at half time just to give players a rest. Definitely worth taking him. You know, he, he's great on the ball. He's good with both feet. I remember the absolute screamer he scored on his left foot earlier in the season. Fantastic goal that was. Definitely take him. So that's most in midfielders. The only one I'd take after that is James Milner. Now, James Milner... Yeah, I'm a Villa fan, so I saw James Milner when really I thought he played his best football, which was the last season he spent at Aston Villa. And he played in central midfield. And for me, I've always thought that that is his best position. You know, like I mentioned, you know, when I was talking about Andros Townsend, James Milner is not the sort of player who's going to frighten a fullback, is he? He's not the most pacey player. He's not the most technically tricky or gifted, but he's a hard worker. He will run for you all day. He will defend properly, and when he's on the ball, he, he's decent. You know, he can pass. 
He has a decent cross, so if he can drift wide, he'd be there. But the, the main attribute of James Milner is his versatility. You can play him at right back if you needed to. You could play him at right midfield. You can play him centre midfield. You could play him on the left wing if you had to. And he will do a job for you. And it's always useful to have players like that in a, in a World Cup squad. Because a couple of injuries could leave you massively short in positions. But with, with a James Milner in a team, he can cover a lot of positions in that midfield. Definitely worth taking. So that's the midfielders. Let's move on to the strike force. First pick, Wayne Rooney. No questions about that. I, I think this season he's actually beginning to show his best football again. He he blatantly fell out with Alex Ferguson last year at Old Trafford. There's no other reason why he'd be so unhappy. He, there was something going on there. You know, Fergie coming out at the end of last season saying Wayne had asked for a transfer request and then Rooney says he hadn't and it just went back and forth and back and forth and now under David Moyes he's playing more he's playing more as a striker and less in midfield, which he, he blatantly didn't like doing. And for me, he's beginning to show what a great player he is. Scored a very, very good header against Poland again. Just a great player. Definitely take him. And he will play up front with Daniel Sturridge. And Daniel Sturridge has finally showed what a good player he is. Because when he was at Chelsea and Man City, he had a lot of potential. Everyone knew he had the ability. And he perhaps didn't get the chances. He didn't get you know, the opportunities in the first team to show really what he could do. But he's playing every game for Liverpool. He's playing in a team that will always create chances. I mean, when you've got players like Gerrard, Coutinho, Suarez, all of these players around you, you're always going to get service. And he will have a great season this year. There's no doubt about that in my mind. And for me, he's a very, very good player. Definitely got to take him. And for me, Rooney and Sturridge will be the nailed on starters in all the big games for England in the World Cup, barring injuries or barring an absolute catastrophic loss of form, which I can't see happening. So... That bit of partnership. On the bench, I would put a certain Mr. Ricky Lambert. Now, Ricky Lambert coming from like League One, League Two, working his way up, and now he's got two goals in three England games. He shows what he can do. You know, he's a target man, he's a presence, he can win headers, but he's not just a big lump. You know, he's good on the ball, he can hold it up and link players in. And he takes an absolutely banging penalty. And when you're an England fan, it's always nice to have a couple of players who can take penalties. Because you know us. We will get to a penalty shootout. And an upstep's Ashley Young. And you think, oh, God, this is this is all over. So he can take a penalty, definitely in the side. It was between him and Andy Carroll for that position, I think. And I prefer Ricky Lambert to Andy Carroll. You know, Carroll... <sighs> What, what has he done, really? He's done absolutely nothing since that first six-month spell at Newcastle. And since then, he's done nothing. He's had millions and millions of pounds splashed out on him. He's on astronomical wages and nothing, really. Not very many goals, not very many assists. For me, it's Ricky Lambert all day. Definitely put him on the plane. And then the fourth striker is Danny Welbeck. Now, Danny Welbeck, again, sort of falls into the James Milner style of player, where he's just so incredibly versatile. He can play up front. He can play on the wings. I can remember in the Champions League last season against Real Madrid, they actually played him as sort of a man-marking role to put Xabi Alonso out the game. So he'd sit in the midfield. He'd make sure Madrid didn't get the ball easily, and he'd try and harry. And as soon as United run, uh, won the ball back, he would bomb upfield on the counter-attack and get forward. You know, Danny Welbeck is so versatile. He'll work really hard for you. He's good on the ball. He's technically gifted. You know Some of the little touches and flicks he does, you know, they're very, very good to, to watch. The one question mark over Danny Welbeck is he can't finish his dinner. His finishing is atrocious. One Premier League goal all last season for Manchester United is just not good enough. If I played 20 games in the Premier League for Manchester United, I would be disappointed if I only scored one Premier League goal. And I am nowhere near international standards. So Danny Welbeck has to improve that side of his game. He has to score more goals. But everything else is definitely there. And his versatility is very useful again. Because a couple of injuries, you could put Welbeck on the wing. And there'd be no you know, appreciable loss of talent or ability in that position. So... That's my final pick. That's the 23 players I'd go for. There were a couple I was looking at. You know, players like Ravel Morrison I was debating about trying to squeeze in there somewhere. But for me, you know, it's too early to pick Ravel Morrison. He's had, what, two or three good games? You can't pick players for a World Cup squad based on that. So, in the end, I was pretty happy to go with these players. Just be pretty interested to see what you guys think, actually. Do you agree with my choices? Would you play someone else? I would definitely look and see what your opinions are there. But guys, thank you so, so much for watching the video. I've ran slightly over the game, so I'll tack some of the footage on the end. Probably another game I've been playing. But once again, thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And as always...